My name is Zach. Uh, I am a senior at Concordia University. Um, black man, hello. Non-athletic black man. Uh, my name is Tevin Smith. I'm also a senior here at Concordia. I'm involved in a few things. Uh, for one, I'm in track and field, men's track and field. I'm the men's representative, as well as the sprinter uh, for the team captain for the men's. I'm involved in BSU. I'm the co-president for Black Student Union. I'm also the president of Lambda Pi Eta. I'm involved in Leaders of Leadership, the tradition teams on campus. Uh, that is uh, the spirit upbringing, what we do here. And what else am I about? I got two jobs. But <laughs> I'm Kylie Bowman. Um, I used to be the goalkeeper here for Concordia University. Uh, I'm a sophomore. I'm majoring in business, minor in mathematics. My goal with that is to maybe be going to teaching, some form of helping out kids, whether if it's athletic related, in school related, or even both. Um, my thoughts on that are also maybe therapy for athletes, injured athletes that maybe need help with that, or the mental aspects for sports to me is more important than the actual physical. How did your upbringing um, shape your identity as a black person? Like, what are all like the trials and tribulations that you went through, and, and how did that lead you, lead all the way up to at this point right now? <laughs> we won't take that far. <laughs> Go ahead. you like, as a biracial person who grew up in San Antonio, half Hispanic, half black, coming from my area, my school in particular, where it was mainly Hispanics, mainly. It wasn't predominantly black. And if they if we were black, it was half white, half black. So there was really no like full blown black culture. There was none like MLK type of celebration, type none of that. Like we had BSU here, there was none of that in my area where I was from. So especially coming here to Concordia and seeing black students who really thrive and who they are and show like their authentic black selves, and especially like in BSU seeing like how much Concordia and how much each student takes part in BSU was really different compared to like what I experienced growing up because I experienced more of my Hispanic heritage than I did my black so coming here it was a very big change for me personally. Just coming here in 2020 I uh, noticed that there was a black student union and I was just like okay like this is something that I've been searching for but I've yet to found so or find so once I did involved myself with it. Um, it opened up a lot more opportunities, more possibilities for me to grow and expand on the heritage of like yeah. black people and my black culture here. So mm -hmm. that's really been like the, the stepping stone of where like I want to go and like all the potential that we have with this organization. So it's really yeah it's been a it's been a long journey and you know, it's still a process. So what was it yeah man we here and uh, St. Paul is similar to Austin in it's cultural, but really that just means there's a lot of, there's a lot of Native Americans and white people and then like little niece of black. Mm -hmm. We do, I didn't see Hispanic until I came to Texas. <laughs> TBH, but I'm like, it's North, so that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So a lot of that, being surrounded, uh, surrounded by a heavy population of non-blacks. My mom specifically took the initiative as a single parent to engrave in me to understand my blackness at a young age and truly tell me like, you need to know how this world views you and then be aware of who you are as a black person coming up in you know, this country and everything. So she hit me at a young age. You know, she made me read, watch Roots at like five. <laughs> like she, she said, it's time, you need to know. All right, mom understood me and I better understood myself when I was around her in my household. But outside, the perception that was placed upon me, I never fit in a box of what it was to be a black person like coming up. Like middle school, elementary, high school, I was the weird kid. I was a nerd kid, you know? I had glasses when I was seven, so you know your boy was over here, you know? <laughs> into anime, into comic books, into science, and 
into like things that are different than you see and I guess like a standard black person and everything. I wasn't hood, okay? I wasn't the streets over here. I guess I had, I talked proper and people got on me for that. Be like, oh, hi, yeah, yeah, this, yeah, he white boy over here, this is white boy. So avidly I was called white just because mm. I didn't fit in the mold of what it meant to be black. Problematic, but I didn't understand that until, you know, now and everything coming up. And so, dude, like, especially from where I grew up, I never knew, like, exactly what you were talking about. Like, yeah. the problem with people touching black people's hair until I grew up. And I'm not gonna lie, because, <laughs> because I guess for me in my household, my father is black, my mother is Hispanic. Mm -hmm. Usually, and I only say this because this is the stereotype I tend to see, but the mother that's black, the child ends up enduring more of their blackness mm -hmm. than what my father had shown me. So growing up, when I would walk around like the ball and stuff with people, especially in San Antonio, it's a lot of Hispanics, white predominantly, it's like people would come up to me and be like, oh, I like your hair, just touch it. And so when I never saw a problem with that until I grew up and I actually like realized that that's not okay. Like, cause in town we have like this thing called fiesta. So every year fiesta, there's always these drunk people that'll just walk around. And of course, like, wow. it wasn't until I was maybe like 17, and some lady came up to me. She was like, I like your hair, I reached out, I didn't even ask. Yeah. And I was like, yeah. yep. no, I was like, <laughs> why, why are you doing that? And it never clicked like in yeah. my head that that's like not okay to do, or that's like not normal to do mm -hmm. until I like got older from that because I was never around that. Yeah. I was never around like someone to tell me like, hey, so much of it. You shouldn't touch the hair like that, right? I had people ask me if my hair was real. I still ask that. Yeah! <laughs> you serious? Yeah. Uh, really? Like, you know, let me just pop up this. All right, they think it's a wig. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like a really high class wig. Yes. <laughs> yes. Over here. That was, that was my, I had the opposite experience from what you had. Like, see, so you That's grew true. up knowing and like, I'm not even gonna lie, it wasn't until my freshman year coming in, so last year, I went to my first black beauty supply store. I'd never actually been in to like go and buy, and not when I started taking care of my hair more, it's because I grew into more products and stuff. Yeah. But I was more around like, like Pantene, for example. I didn't know that was bad for our hair, y'all. Mm. Until yeah. like my high school. <laughs> yeah, but like there's, right. there's, there's that, that graduate that I had to teach myself. Yeah. I had to teach myself in a sense, like how to take care of myself as a black woman. Yeah. It was also mixed. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? No, I get you because I, I'm not mixed, but I understand it's a whole different world right. because you get so many aspects, mm -hmm. but then you also, the biggest part is that's, I feel like, engraved and like pushed upon you is understanding your blackness. Right. And if you're not black enough, right. primarily, especially for biracial people, right. you're given so much help. 